beloved. Welcome to First United Methodist Church. I am Dr. Felicia LeBoy, lead pastor and life coach of the historic First United Methodist Church in downtown Elgin, Illinois. Thank you for joining us in worship. If you ever have any questions or need anything, if you would like to get more information about our church, if you want to participate in any of our online classes or anything like that, please go to our church website at fumcelgin, e -L -G -I -N .org. Again, that's fumcelgin.org. As we are getting ready for worship, I want to turn your attention to all of these exciting announcements. Also want to let you know that on September the 20th, that'll be the time for our first in-service uh, worship service. If you would like to participate, please call, call the church office to make a reservation. There will be mask and social distancing, and also on that Sunday, we will have a remembering your baptism service. We, so this Sunday, we're going to bless our water for that, and if you're interested in getting some blessed water, and you know that you'll be joining us online, we invite you to call the church office so that we might send you a vial of water. Turn your attention now to our, our announcements, and we'll see you back in the sanctuary. Thank you, and be blessed. Hi, church family. We have exciting news in a couple of weeks on September 20th. We will all be reconvening back at our church for worship. So outside, we will have everyone line up, hopefully bef before 845 so that we can get everyone in the door. And then as you come in, we'll have an usher who's taking your temperature and checking you in because you'll have to reserve your spot online because only 50 people can come into the sanctuary. Also, I'm not wearing my mask just because of the video, but inside the building, everyone will be wearing a mask. Come on in. So, once we get to here, the ushers will be taking you directly to your seats. So don't worry, you can sit with your family, but everyone will be placed every other pew. Unfortunately, we will not be able to do congregational singing and you have to keep your mask on at all times, but that is only because we care so much about everyone's safety. Thanks, Allison. Well, I'll tell you what, folks, why don't we do this? We're going to demonstrate a little bit about what we're going to do on Sunday morning. So, hey, the Duncan family, come on in. What I'm going to do is I'm going to sit you guys right over here. And hey, guess what? They're from the same family. They get to sit together. So don't worry. If you come in with your family, you get to sit together. But we're going to do this every other row. So the next family or person is going to sit up here. And social distancing actually is going to happen, so we need to do about every six feet. Uh, the middle of there will be blocked off, so we'll be uh, social distancing uh, very well. And so this is going to be at the direction of the ushers, and uh, we'll keep it as safe as we can. And there is one other thing that I want to tell you about. It's going to be a little different for everybody. We're not going to have any hymnals. We're not going to have any Bibles or anything in the pews for sanitary reasons. So we will have the screens down and we will have the words nice and big for you, okay? Now at the conclusion of the service, an usher is going to go ahead and ask that everyone leave in order. So we'll ask each pew uh, to leave. Folks, go ahead and uh, leave. Thank you for coming. Have a good week. And the other thing that's going to happen is once you leave uh, the sanctuary, unfortunately, we can't have you in the narthex. So if you do wish to talk to other friends and so forth, you can go ahead and leave the building. Oh, that was great, huh? Oh, man, I'm so happy to be back at church, even if it looks a little bit different. Okay, I know by now you're probably thinking that that's so much to remember, but you'll have lots of friendly faces here to help you when you get here. All you need to remember is that before you come, you need to register either online or you can call the office. And don't forget your face mask, but we will have extras and lots of hand sanitizer as well. So we hope to see you and can't wait. As you just saw, First UMC Elgin will be returning to in-person worship on Sunday, September 20th. A limited number of seats will be available. Please register online at fumcelgin.org or call the church office. The in-person worship service on September 20th will feature a baptism renewal. During this portion of the service, Rev. Dr. Felicia LeBoy will ask members to remember their baptismal vows and to anoint themselves with holy water. 
If you would like to be a part of this service at home, please contact the church office and a volunteer will bring you a vial of holy water that has been blessed. Did you know that you can find all of our weekly services, bulletins, and monthly newsletters online at fumcelgin.org? Just click on the Media tab at the top of the page or on the Worship at Home banner to find them. Have you checked out the weekly motivational moments from the Bible yet? Every Monday, Rev. Dr. Felicia LeBoy releases a new moment designed to help you make the Bible an essential part of your everyday life. Look for them on the first UMC Elgin website and across our social media pages. Joys and concerns can be submitted via the First UMC Elgin website by clicking on the tab at the top of the page or by calling the church office directly. With your permission, your request will be shared with the congregation during the Sunday morning worship service. The Reflections Women's Bible Study will resume on Thursday, September 17th at 9 a.m. via Zoom. We are excited to be using a book written by Rev. Dr. Felicia LeBoy entitled Unstuck. This eight-week study is for all women needing a new perspective on God's promises, so we can take steps to co-create with God the life that He intends for us. Pastor Felicia plans to drop in occasionally for conversation and coffee. If you are interested in being a part of this new adventure, please call or email Amy in the church office. The United Methodist Women invite all women to come to the woods for conversation and coffee with Pastor Felicia, Saturday, October 3rd at Burnage Forest Preserve. The first session from 9 to 10 a.m. has reached capacity, but a second session has been added from 10.30 to 11.30. Come and welcome Pastor Felicia and enjoy a time of socially distanced fellowship. We will create a large circle of friendship and love. Wear your mask and bring a chair and travel mug of coffee so we can all safely gather. Contact Jane Duffy or Kathy Long to sign up. Group size is limited, even in the woods. The UMW cares for our community and planet with green masks for God. Pick one up for yourself and one for someone you love. Our handmade recycled material masks will be available with your donation at our gathering in the woods. Mark your calendar for the next Dismantling Racism panel discussion event titled The Theological Roots of Racism and Colonialism on September 16th at noon via Facebook Live. Panelists will discuss how the church has the ability to theologically interpret our current realities naming where God is present and where humanity is called to help bring about the kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. Visit umc.org slash nracism for more information. The I Am Her Women's Leadership Summit, hosted by the General Commission on the Status and Role of Women, will be held online October 8th through 10th. This virtual event will not be your ordinary conference. It's a movement of women coming together to be inspired, be empowered, and be equipped to do the work personally, professionally, and within the UMC to connect. The keynote speaker will be New York Times bestselling author Nadia Bowles-Weber. Contact the church office or visit garrett.edu slash events for more information.
for the call to worship. Come to hear the word. Come to do the word. Come to experience comfort. Come to experience challenge. Come to find cost. Come to find joy. Come to find humanity. Come to find community. Come to find church. Come to find God. Please be with me in prayer. Eternal God, you bring light out of darkness and hope out of despair. Share your love with us this day that we may be better that we may better love each other. Touch our hearts and help our love shine forth in a world hungry to know your love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
this morning is from the book of Romans, chapter 14, verses 1 through 12, and I'll be reading this from the message. Welcome with open arms, fellow believers who don't see things the way you do, and don't jump all over them every time they do or say something you don't agree with, even when it seems that they are strong on opinions but weak in the faith department. Remember, they have their own history to deal with. Treat them gently. For instance, a person who has been around for a while might well be convinced that he can eat anything on the table, while another, with a different background, might assume that he should only be a vegetarian and eat accordingly. But since both are guests at Christ's table, wouldn't it be terribly rude if they fell to criticizing what the other ate and didn't eat? God, after all, invited both to the table. Do you have any business crossing people off the guest list or interfering with God's welcome? If there are corrections to be made or manners to be learned, God can handle that without your help. Or say one person thinks that some days should be set aside as holy, and another thinks that each day is pretty much like all the others. There are good reasons either way. So each person is free to follow the convictions of conscience. What's important in all this is that if you keep a day holy day, keep it for God's sake. If you eat meat, eat it to the glory of God. And thank God for prime rib. Amen. If you're a vegetarian, eat vegetables to the glory of God. And thank God for broccoli. None of us are permitted to insist on our own way in these matters. It's God we are answerable to, all the way from life to death and everything in between. Not each other. That's why Jesus lived and died and lived again, so that we could, he could be our master across the entire range of life and death and free us from the petty tyrannies of each other. So where does that leave you when you criticize a brother? And where does that leave you when you condescend to a sister? I'd say it leaves you looking pretty silly or worse. Eventually, we're all going to end up kneeling side by side in the place of judgment, facing God. Your critical and condescending ways aren't going to improve your position there one bit. Read it for yourself in Scripture. As I live and breathe, God says, every knee will bow before me. Every tongue will tell the truth that I, and only I, am God. So mind your own business. You've got your hands full just taking care of your own life before God. In other words, stay in your own lane. Here ends the reading of the scripture. Greetings. Won't you join us for our scripture for this morning's lesson? And I'll be reading from Exodus chapter 14, verses 15 through 31, and I'll be reading from the New International Version. Then the Lord said to Moses, why are you crying out to me? Tell the Israelites to move on. Raise your staff and stretch out your hand over the sea to divide the water so that the Israelites can go through the sea on dry ground. I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians so that they will go in after them. And I will gain glory through Pharaoh and all his army, through his chariots and his horses. The Egyptians will know that I am the Lord when I gain glory through Pharaoh, his chariots, and his horsemen. Then the angel of God, who had been traveling in front of Israel's army, withdrew and went behind them. The pillar of cloud also moved from in front and stood behind them, coming between the armies of Egypt and Israel. Throughout the night, the cloud brought darkness to the one side and light to the other, so neither went near the other all night long. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and all the night the Lord drove the sea back with a strong east wind and turned it into dry land. The waters were divided, and the Israelites went through the sea on dry ground with a wall of water on their right and on their left. And the Egyptians pursued them, and all Pharaoh's horses and chariots and horsemen followed them into the sea. During the last watch of the night, the Lord looked down from the pillar of fire and cloud, at the Egyptian army and threw it into confusion. 
He jammed the wheels of their chariots so that they had difficulty driving. And the Egyptians said, let's get away from the Israelites. The Lord is fighting for them against Egypt. Then the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand over the sea so that the waters may flow back over the Egyptians and their chariots and horsemen. So Moses stretched out his hand over the sea and at daybreak, the sea went back to its place. The Egyptians were fleeing toward it and the Lord swept them into the sea. The waters flowed back and covered the chariots and horsemen, the entire army of Pharaoh that had followed the Israelites into the sea. Not one of them survived. But the Israelites went through the sea on dry ground with a wall of water on their right and on their left. But that day, the Lord saved Israel from the hands of the Egyptians, and Israel saw the Egyptians lying dead on the shore. And when the Israelites saw the mighty hand of the Lord displayed against the Egyptians, the people feared the Lord and put their trust in him and in Moses, his servant. I want to share with you for a few minutes from the title, from the topic, Who Leads? Who Leads? Let's pray. God, we thank you so much for this time together. We thank you, God because you are always showing us new things from your word. So God, I pray that you would open our ears to hear, that you would give us eyes to see, that you would break up the stoniness of our heart, that we might receive your word and that it might produce a harvest, some 30, some 60, some 100 fold in our lives. I pray to God that you would move the natural and the carnal me out of your way so that you might use every gift that you've given me to speak a word of hope, of transformation, and of healing. In Jesus' name we pray, and the people of God said, so let me ask you in your life, who leads? Who is ultimately lead your life? More importantly, when you, what do you do when you get stuck between a rock and a hard place? Who leads then? What do you rely on? For many of us, when we come to a moment of crisis, when we are stuck between a rock and a hard place, the first thing we do is we, we panic, right? We fear. We uh, get on the phone, we call somebody, and finally, maybe, if we can have the presence of mind to think about it, we might pray or call out to God. But our fears really begin to, cook, to kick in, right, anytime that we're in between a rock and a hard place. In fact, Todd Bolzinger, the author of Cover the Canoeing the Mountains, Christian Leadership in Uncharted Territory says that in the moment of crisis, we will not rise, we often don't rise to the occasion, we will default to our training. What that simply means is that if we find ourselves in a financial difficulty, we'll go back to what worked with for us in the past. If we find ourselves in dealing with an issue with our family, we'll go back to who or what worked in the past. And really, beloved, the issue is that there is another way for the people of God. See, in this passage that I read from Exodus 14, Moses finds himself not between a rock and a hard place, but between an army and a sea. He finds himself in a situation. He is definitely in a predicament. Looking at it from a natural perspective, if he walks towards the sea, it's sudden death, and if he turns around to face Pharaoh, it's certain death, or so he could think. And it's interesting to me in this Prince of Tides moment, right, or Prince of Egypt moment, that God gives Moses some very interesting instructions, right? Here are the three things that God says to Moses when Moses is between a rock and a hard place. First, he says, why are you crying out to me? Then he says, tell the people to get moving and raise your staff and hold it out over the water. Now, I don't know about you, but if I'm standing in front of the ocean, or maybe if you're in Illinois and standing in front of Lake Michigan, it does not seem to me that holding a stick up over my head would be a sure way to get through. And it seems to me very reasonable that I have every right to cry out to God because I am in a predicament. But really, if you think about it, and if you go back and read a few chapters before this one, or even if you start at the beginning of Exodus 1 through 4, it is not so strange that when God is asking Moses, why are you crying out to me? He's asking them that because he had already told Moses, I'm going to deliver you. 
All of this is going to be set up for your good and my glory. And I promise you that I'm going to deal with your en enemies. I'm going to trick them into following you. I'm going to deliver you. And then I'm going to get the glory. God had told them what was going to happen. And because God had told them what was going to happen, he was looking at them saying, why are you so fearful when I've already made you a promise? I've already given you my word and I'm already showing you what it is to do. I didn't tell you to turn around. I didn't tell you to turn to the left or the right. I didn't tell you to worry about the Egyptians. I told you to move ahead. I already got this taken care of. So what does this have to do with us when we are in times of uncertain, uncertainty? Well, I think a lot, right? As Bolzinger says, we revert back to what we know. We revert back to whatever got us out of the situation before. We lead out of our emotions so we're panicked and we fear, we cry. And if we don't do that, many of us try to keep, especially if there's some people conflict, we try to keep, keep the people fixed, right? And what I mean by that is during this time, what Moses could have done is he could have went through to make sure that everybody was okay. They felt all right about the situation. He could have started some uh, don't fear Egypt. He could have made signs for don't fear Egypt. He could have start, asked the people to start singing. He could have done, done a lot of things keeping people fixed. And many of us who are in leadership waste a whole lot of time trying to justify what we've been told to do because we have... We are addicted to people pleasing. We are addicted to keeping people fixed. We are, uh, we do all of these other things that keep us diverted from what we've been told to do. God has already given us precious promises. He's already told us that he, uh, that he is for us and not against us. He has already promised us that every situation we find ourselves in will be for our good and his glory. And it is not the time to lead out of our fear or panic. It's not the time to cry. It's not the time to explain, justify, and keep other folk fixed because we are in earned certain times. The thing to do now is to lead and to lead decisively. But if we are going to lead and lead decisively, and I'm not just talking about people like me, right, pastors, I'm talking about that there are many of us, especially in this COVID crisis, who have the opportunity to lead. There are teachers who lead their students, there are principals, there are presidents, there are company folks, there are managers. All of us have an opportunity to lead. There are moms trying to figure out what to do with their kids. God gives each of us a sphere of influence. And these are very uncertain times. And so, beloved, what I want to suggest is that in this morning's lesson, there is a lesson for each of us that early on, if it, if it is true that we will revert back to our training, then I just came by to give our training a boost and say that up front, we have to decide who's going to lead when we find ourselves between a rock and a hard place. We have to decide early on who's going to lead. Will God lead? Will we lead out of our own mindset and mentality? Will we let the people dictate what we're going to do? Or will we acknowledge our limitations and admit that we are just human and that God alone knows what it is that we should do? And will we operate based on the last instruction that we've been given and to move forward? See, beloved, all I am suggesting that we need to do that when we lead in uncertain times is first of all decide who leads, God or you or I or the people. We have to acknowledge our limitations. We do not know everything. We can't figure it out, and many times we don't have time to figure it out because we have to begin to just move. We need to lay down our expectations. You know, part of this in terms of leading in uncertain times, many of us, especially if we are people who perform well and do well, we have all kinds of expectations about how excellent we should be able to, to operate in a new environment, right? We think that if we were a straight-A student here, we should be a straight-A student there. If we had everything under control or we had a certain amount of excellence in this in a past place, that it should be the same amount of excellence in a new place. But beloved, the very fact that we are in an uncertain place says that we are learning, that we are going to make mistakes. And so we have to be willing to lay down our expectations. And not only that, we have to help 
Others lay down their expectations about what we ought to do. Well, where do you get that at, Pastor Felicia? Remember the people, if you keep reading through the passage, people are like, oh, you just brought us out here to let us die. You know, basically they're like, turn around and tell Pharaoh that, that we will go back and we will serve him because for those people, Pharaoh was God. Beloved, part of the unenviable job of being a leader says that you have to set a new expectation. And now that, you have to pick up God's declaration. God says, pick up your staff, Moses. This is the staff that I, I, I gave you to lead my people in the first place. Pick up God's declarations. That's another way of saying, pick up God's promises. So beloved, let me put a pin right there and ask you, what promises of God do you have that you can rely on in times of uncertainty when things get scary and you and I get worried? Now, I don't know about you. Some people may say, well, if you're a pastor, of course you would have these scriptures memorized. I had scripture memorized before I was a pastor. And because my memory is not all that, I have pasted on my mirror in my bed, in my bathroom, in my bedroom every morning scriptures, passages that are there to remind me of God's word, that he'll never leave me or forsake me, that he promises to help me, that, that, he, that because I am in him, that he will provide me with all sufficiency, that he is my shepherd that I shall not want. Beloved, if we are going to be okay in uncertain times, we need a staff, we need a rod, we need God's word and God's promises, and we need to put them someplace so that we can f focus our attention on the right things, and then, beloved, we have no choice but to move out in the direction that God has told us, even when no one else thinks it makes sense. I'm listening to an interesting book. It says, Girls, Stop Apologizing. And what the person says is that many of us never fulfill the thing that God wants us to do because we try to keep everyone fixed or because it's not easy at first or because it's uncertain. And what she says is, basically, we have to rely on God's promises to us and then move out in the direction that God told us, even if it doesn't make sense to us or anyone else. So let, let me get down to the nitty gritty specifically about what it means for the congregation that I pastor and those of you who may visit us on September the 20th. See, beloved, when we enter into our building on September the 20th, we will not be having church as usual. There'll be no time of fellowship. There won't be any greeters. We just have to trust that if two or three are gathered in his name, that we will be here in the presence of God and that God will show up and honor the fact that we've come and that we are gathered with those of you who join us by radio and by video and that God will be here to meet our need and to calm our fears. We have to understand that we can't make incremental changes to what no, lo what no longer works. So there'll be some stuff that we used to do before COVID that it would be nice if we could do during COVID do, while we're still dealing with this thing. We can't, we, there won't be any incremental steps to do that. And we can't focus on our past, but we have to reorient our church to its purpose and its mission in this COVID environment. Beloved, simply put, what I'm saying is we're going to have to move from fixing or having an attitude of fixing things. This is this all around laying down these expectations to exploring things. I mean, can you imagine what it must meant for the children of Israel walking between two walls of water with the sharks like right around the edges and you're walking through? Probably never saw anything like that, don't know how to operate anything like that. But God has said, this is the way. There's a wonderful other book that I'm reading. It's called Quietly Courageous, and it's by a leading uh, church consultant, Gil Rendell. He's done a lot of work in our denomination, and it's just leading the church in a changing world. And what he talks about, the fact is, he gives a story about when the children of Israel, not when they're crossing through the Red Sea, but when they're crossing the Jordan into the Promised Land. And he talks about the fact that even though there is the promise of going into the Promised Land, and God has said, I'm, I'm going to split the water and, and let you go across, 
that what the folks start doing is they start having meetings. All the priests get together and have a meeting about, well, who should go first and how should we do it? Should we build a bridge? What should we do? And there's one priest by the name of Nation. And what Nation does is he just begins to walk towards the water. And while he's walking towards the water, the, path, the other priests are saying, what are you doing? The so guy said, walk this way. We're going through the Jordan and to the promised land. And, and that's all the instruction that we got. And we're going that way. God has been faithful and we're going this way. And it says that when he walked in the water, his ankles got covered. Jordan didn't split. His knee, he walked up to knee deep. Water didn't split. He got chest high in the water. Water didn't split. And finally, when he gets up to the water just under his nose, the water splits. But what are you saying, Pastor Felicia? What I'm saying is that if we rely on the promises of God and we turn our attention to the fact that God has never led us in a way that has not been for our good and our glory, then we can be rest assured that God will take care of us. And that, to me, is mighty, mighty good news. What about you? Amen? Amen. We want to remind you that um, on September 20th, our first service that we will be having back inside of our sanctuary, we are also going to be doing a Remembering Your Baptism service. The point of doing this service yearly is to remind ourselves of God's words over each of us in our baptism. The same words he said to Jesus, which are, you are my beloved, in whom I am well pleased, before Jesus did anything. If you want to participate in this service, please know that today as I bless the water, that you can receive a vial of holy water so that you might have it in your home, so that next week you might join us in this service of remembering our baptism, to remember all that God has done with us in Jesus Christ, is symbolized by the water and the spirit, and that also we can remind ourselves of the commitments we made to God in that divine exchange. Commitments to pray, to give of our time, our talents, our service, our gifts, and our witness. Won't you prepare your hearts and minds now as we prepare to offer thanksgiving over the water. And as I said before, if you are interested in receiving a vial of holy water so that you might join us in this service, even from home, there's no time or space in God then I want to invite you to contact our church office. Um, you can reach us at fumcelgin.org. That's fumcelgin.org. Why don't you join us now as we prepare to bless this water. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Eternal Father, when nothing existed but chaos, you swept across the dark waters and brought forth light. In the days of Noah, you saved those on the ark through water. And after the flood, you set in the clouds a rainbow. When you saw your people as slaves in Egypt, you led them to freedom through the sea. Their children you brought through the Jordan to the land which you promised. Sing to the Lord, all the earth. Tell of God's mercy each day. In the fullness of time, you sent Jesus, nurtured in the water of a womb. He was baptized by John and anointed by your spirit. He called his disciples to share in the baptism of his death and resurrection and to make disciples of all nations. Declare Christ's works to the nations, his glory among all the people. Pour out your Holy Spirit and by this gift of water call to our remembrance the, your grace declared to us in our baptism. For you alone have washed away our sins and you clothe us with the righteousness throughout our lives, that dying and rising with Christ, we may share in his final victory. All praise to you, eternal Father, through your Son, Jesus Christ, who with you and the Holy Spirit lives and reigns forever. Amen. Amen. Remember again that this water has now been blessed, and if you would like a vial of the holy water so that you might participate in our remembrance of our baptism service, on Sunday, September the 20th, please contact the church office at fumcelgin.org. Again, that's fumcelgin.org. Thank you so much.
To the only wise God, our Savior, be glory, power, majesty, dominion, and honor forever and ever. And the people of God said, Amen. 